Hey, I'm excited uh, to get into God's Word this morning. We are continuing our series talking about prayer. And uh, uh, if you have missed it or if this is your very first Sunday here, I forgot to introduce myself. Welcome. My name is Pastor Anthony. Excited that you're here with us. If you're joining us online, welcome. And also welcome all of you that are joining us from Fort Scott. Um, excited to see what God is doing there. Hey, just a quick side note. I totally forgot this, but uh, since I touched on Fort Scott, this past week, we had our counterculture connection, second service. Uh, we had one a month ago with an outreach on campus, and uh, we had a college, one of our own students uh, speaking at it, Caleb, who God is doing an amazing work. We had 38 students at counterculture in Fort Scott. Can we celebrate that? Isn't that awesome? So cool. Excited for you, Fort Scott. God is doing a great work there. Prayer. We've, uh, if you've missed it, uh, check out our app. Please uh, go uh, check out the messages that you've missed and, and stay current. But, uh, man, we have been starting our services uh, by praying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you may feel like you're at Catholic Church today because you're standing and sitting, right? It's a good thing. Sometimes it's good to keep you awake. Um, but we're going to stand because we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer as one unified body. And many of you know the prayer by now, and you should be able to pray it. But if not, we do have it on the screen for you. But we hope that this will be a, a lifestyle that you start to adopt, that you start to prioritize praying the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray it together. Here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Prayer, a way to communicate, to be in relationship being with Jesus and becoming like Jesus. And we've been talking about prayer and, and, and the importance of prayer. We've been talking about entering into the Holy of Holies and how we have access through Jesus Christ. Man, last week we got to talk about the altar. We are celebrating this morning. Many people came to the altar last week. And we've heard testimony after testimony all week. There was a family that, there were people that were in bondage in certain areas where they were set free from this bondage. And it was a bondage that they held on for four years, four whole years, and God set them free. There were other stories of people that showed up and God reminded them of who they are in Christ in a relationship. I had people that had approached me and said, man, you know what, that thing you talked about, I thought I couldn't come to the altar because it was a place of guilt and shame, and condemnation, and judgment, and so I was just holding back, and, and it was so encouraging to know that the altar is a safe place, a place where we are invited to come, where there is freedom, and so they got to come to the altar for the first time, and not feel shame, or not feel condemnation, or not feel judgment, but to feel the freedom that comes in being in the presence of Jesus Christ, and if you were not here last week, man, it was so awesome just to see the church approach the altar. Not to run from the altar, but run towards the altar. A place of meeting, meeting the Creator, the Lord and Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we talked about how the altar is not just for the church. If you are waiting to come to the altar just on a Sunday, you are missing out. The altar is any place that you choose to connect with the Creator, to connect with Jesus Christ. That could be in your living room, on your recliner. That could be driving to work, holding on to that steering wheel. That could be in your cafeteria at school. That could be at the park bench. Wherever you choose to connect with Jesus is the altar. It's a safe place. It's not a place of weakness. It's not a place of judgment, not a place of shame. We talked about how the altar, a place of peace versus fear, a place of redemption versus shame, a place of freedom versus bondage, a place of power versus weakness, a place to run towards and not 
to run away. If you missed it, I encourage you to check out our app and you can get the whole message right there. And Hebrews 4.16 says, and this is a command for you and me, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, not with fear, not with shame, not with judgment, not with uh, bondage, but with confidence because when we come there, we receive the mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. And so that is our anchor uh, verse that I want us to run with um, as we unpack today's message. Today, um, I want to talk about what happens at the altar. If that's here, if that's at your home, wherever you choose to hang out with God, what happens at the altar? The conversation that is had, the prayers that are prayed, the listening that we do as we obediently listen and wait to discover the will of the Father for our lives. What happens at the altar? And, and, and how we pray at the altar. How many of you have ended your prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen? Okay, yeah. And I'm sure we all have different ways that we end our prayer. But what does that mean? What does it mean when we say, in Jesus' name, amen? Do we really understand what that means? Do we understand when we say, in Jesus' name, what, what we are uh, bringing on and what power that comes through that and what freedom that comes out of it? And so this morning, I want us to look at that. I want us to dive into that and to truly understand our goal with this whole series is that you would be better in your relationship with Jesus Christ through prayer because you really understand what you're doing and you're not going through a ritualistic process, but you're building a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and prayer becomes an avenue for you to do that. And that prayer will become vibrant and a powerful tool because it is. So today, I want us to talk about the tremendous promise, the promise of Jesus for you and me, found in John chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, you want to pull it out and turn with me to John chapter 14, verse 12. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen, or you can go to your smart device. But uh, we hope that you would consider bringing your Bibles to church. John 14, verse 12. I tell you the truth. Jesus is saying, I tell you the truth. Today, truth is kind of everything we make out, make it to be, right? But he's saying, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same work I have done. Anyone who believes in me. That is the first step. Being a follower of Jesus Christ, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, being somebody that wants to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Anyone who believes in me, a disciple of Jesus, will do the same works I have done. And then he goes on to say, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. Here is Jesus talking to his disciples, he's talking to us, and he's saying, guess what, I was here, I did this ministry for three years, I showed you how it was done, I gave you all my tools, now I'm going to the Father. I'm going to the Father because I've done everything I need to do, the job is finished, okay, I have uh, paid the ultimate price, I have become the ultimate sacrifice for you and me, I died for you on the cross, I rose on the third day, I'm ascending to heaven, I'm going to go to the, uh, into the heavens, and I'm going to sit at the Father's right hand, and now when the Father sees you, He doesn't see your brokenness, He doesn't see your shame, He doesn't see what He sees, but He sees my blood covering you, because I've done the work. And I'm going to sit at the Father, and I'm going to remind Him, and I'm going to intercede on behalf of you so that the Father's plan for your life will be accomplished. That's what He means by that, by the way. Jesus is sitting at the Father's right hand, interceding for each and every one of you because He loves you, because He died for you, because He paid the price for you. And the Father doesn't see your brokenness when you become a believer, when you give your life to Jesus Christ. All that the Father sees is the blood of Jesus Christ covering you, the grace that He has for you. And so He's saying, I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything 
in my name, here we go, in my name, in Jesus' name, and I will do it. So the Son can bring glory to the Father. See, you've got to understand, the Son came into the world. He stepped into the world to bring glory to the Father. You and I were created in the image of God to do what? To bring glory to the Father. And when we come in the name of Jesus, we align with the heart of Jesus, we align with the heart of the Father, and we bring glory to the Father. We point everything back to the Father. The reason that you gave your life to Jesus Christ is because you saw someone pointing you to the Father. And if we don't point people to the Father, people are not going to know Jesus. There's nothing that I bring that is going to change you. All I'm doing is I'm pointing you to the Father. Anyone that is living a life of Jesus is pointing them to the Father. And he says, I came to bring glory to the Father. I'm going to do that through uh, sitting at the right hand. But when you ask in my name, I will give and will unpack that so that the Father receives glory. And then he goes on to say, yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. So when we come to the altar, what are we, who are we coming to meet? We're coming to meet the Father, the Son, with the power of the Holy Spirit's leading. We're coming to meet the Father and the Son with the power of the Holy Spirit that is leading us into the Holy of Holies. And what are we asked to do? We're asked to ask in the name of Jesus for what He wants us to ask Him. And we're told to ask boldly, with confidence, to step into the Holy of Holies. To ask in His name. So why ask in the name of Jesus? Why ask? When we ask in the name of Jesus, I'll be completely aware of who He is. Remember earlier, as we were wrapping up worship, I said, there were some that said, who is this guy? And I think the the reason we struggle with prayer is because we really don't know who Jesus is. Because we really don't understand the power that is there for us. We really don't understand the freedom that can come. We really don't understand that uh, the bondage that can be set free. We really don't understand that there are so many answers waiting and so many blessings waiting. And so we don't prioritize prayer. Well, what would happen if we truly understood what would come out of it? Think of something that you truly believe in, how you go after it. Think of anything in this world that you truly believe right now. And you, you go after it because you believe in it so much. And we don't believe in prayer because maybe it's very possible that we really don't know who Jesus is. Because we haven't become, we haven't hung out with him in prayer. Are we completely aware of who he is? When we sign his name to the end of our prayer, do we really understand what we are saying? So let's, uh, let me introduce you to him this morning. So if you turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, starting at verse 8, Philippians 2, starting at verse 8. He humbled himself, he, Jesus, humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. He died a criminal's death on the cross. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves you. Because he loves me. Therefore, because he did that, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. So I don't know whose name you're bowing down to right now or you're going after or, man, you're just excited because so-and-so is on TV or, man, so-and-so is going to be doing a concert or, I don't know, maybe I need this poster or, man, this NFL player. I don't know whose name you're going after or running after because they're so cool and famous. But let me tell you, uh, God says here that there is no other name that is higher than the name of Jesus. And that the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow. We may not do that right now, but one day there is coming a day that every knee will bow when we stand face to face with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declares that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
So what do we, what do we learn from this passage? What we learn is that he is the one that humbled himself. He gave up his royalty to come to this earth for you and me. To go to the cross, to die on that cross for you and me. He humbled himself. The one that died a criminal's death on the cross. That is who we are coming to. The one that died for you before you were even were willing to be <laughs> in relationship with him. Before you even came to him and said, you know what? Yes, I'm sinful. I'm sorry. Before you even said, I'm sorry. I need you. Jesus in my life. He died for you on that cross. And he died a criminal's death. One of the worst deaths that anyone can die in that time that Jesus lived. He's the one that was elevated by his father to the highest honor. To the highest honor. And the one that was given the name above all other names the one who at, at the mention of his name that we are called to bow our knees to who is he he's a risen savior and our king he's a risen savior and our king this is who we are approaching when we come to the altar do you know him do you know this Jesus? Do you know whose name we use when we end our prayers and we approach the throne room? It is this king. This is who we get to sign our prayers with when we enter the throne room and we approach the altar. Because he, because Jesus earned access to the throne room to meet gave us access to the throne room to meet with the Father, but He's also interceding on our behalf. So basically, He's fighting for us. He's on our side. He wants the best for us. He wants to bless you. He wants to bring hope. He wants to bring healing. He wants to bring restoration. He wants to give you joy. He wants peace. He's on your side, not against you. He loves you. That is who we come to. Second, do we understand what he's capable of? Because if we don't understand what he's capable of, we won't come to him because, oh, yeah, it's Jesus, right? I mean, I mean, there are so many other people I could go to for help today. I mean, all these other solutions. I got YouTube. I can figure it out, right? Google, right? Or Alexa. Or Siri. Or AI. <laughs> you name it. I got all of this. I got my money. I got my power. I got my fame. Who needs Jesus, right? Do we understand what he is capable of? Ephesians 1. You turn with me. Powerful passage. Chapter 1. Beginning verse 18. Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus. He's speaking to believers like you and me, people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ, people that have built a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's speaking to people, not people that are lost, people that know Jesus. And here's what he says. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light because you're living in darkness, because you really don't understand it, so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. The confident hope, not just the world's hope that is here and is gone tomorrow, but a confident hope. But he says, I pray that your eyes will be open. I pray that you will receive light. I pray that you will truly understand what you are missing out on. Man, you're sitting here on this earth and you think you've figured it out, but you have no clue what you're missing out on. I hope, you, I pray that you would, you would understand this confident hope that, that as His holy people, who we are, once we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we become holy people who are His rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. Power. God's power for those that believe Him. This is God's word right here. 
This is the same mighty power, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead, from the grave, is for you and me. That's what we have. Do we live that way? Do we know him? Do we really understand when we come to, to prayer in Jesus' name what we're coming to? Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. The new heaven and the new earth. He's over all. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. God has put all things, here we go, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of you and me, believers that know Jesus Christ. All things, anything you can think of right now, he's in control. He has power. Your current season of life, your health, your finances, your decision-making, your relationship, your marriage, your, your kids, uh, you name it, your job, whatever you can think of, Christ is the ultimate authority. And the church is His body. We are part of Him. It is made full and complete. You and I are made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. I think we can live on that passage every morning, right? As a reminder that our prayers have power, that our prayers have meaning and, and, and it, it can move the mighty mountains because there is power that comes when we pray in the name of Jesus because all of that is being given to Jesus and is under his feet. He gives us confident hope. We are rich in Him. I'm not talking rich from the standpoint of earthly possessions, but rich from peace, rich from joy, rich from hope, rich from purpose in life, rich from meaning, rich from man. I, I feel fulfilled. Not just worldly riches. Rich in His inheritance because He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He created all things. He's the King of all things, which means He owns everything, which means we have access to everything that He has. And we walk around this world as beggars because we do not pray. His mighty power is in us as long as we believe. God's power is for us to set us free. You may be walking through a situation where you go like, I don't have any power. There's nothing I can do. I'm powerless, I'm weak, I'm broken, I'm messed up, I'm, I, I, I have no hope. And the scripture says the power that raised Jesus from the grave is for you and me in the name of Jesus. He's above any rule or authority or power or leader or anything else. So if you are putting your trust in some earthly leader or earthly system or earthly government or earthly ruler, <laughs> you might be putting it on the wrong place. Because no matter who is in power, God is the ultimate power. Let us refocus our vision on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, not on the systems of this world. He's head over all things for the benefit of you and me. For the benefit, for because he loves us. Remember, he humbled himself, went to the cross and died for you and me because he loves us. He loves us, so he has all of this for our benefit to set us free. Thirdly, do we understand His purpose for our life? His purpose is for us to experience God's love and presence. We don't know this till we experience it, to experience His love and presence. When we are in the presence of God, there is freedom. When we are in the love of God, there is freedom. And to find His mercy and grace, to help us in any kind of need, temptation, weakness, sin, or trial. That pretty much encapsulates the whole thing. 
That's his purpose, to protect you, to provide for you, to bless you, to give you hope, to give you a, a future, to give you meaning in life, to set you free. He has come to set the captives free. That is his purpose. Here's a passage of scripture that helps us understand all of this and puts it all together. Psalms 37. The psalmist is writing Psalm 37 verse 3. And it says, first off, and the most important thing, trust in the Lord and do good. We've got to trust in the Lord. If we don't trust in him, we're not coming to him. We're not praying in his name because we don't believe he can. Because we don't know him. Trust in the Lord. And he goes on to say, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So when we say, ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, what he's trying, let me clarify that. Ask for anything. You're like, yes, I finally found it. I can go ask for my next Corvette, or I can ask for my next new house. Oh, man, I've got this. The PS5 I was waiting for, Jesus, here we go. PS5 in Jesus' name, right? Yeah, right. That doesn't work that way. Let me, let me clarify that. Take delight in the Lord. Here's something important. Are we selfish? Are we selfish people or selfless people? You guys are afraid? I'm selfish. What about you guys? Are we selfish or selfless? Okay. We want what we want, right? We're selfish people. That's because of the sin nature. That's why. Don't feel bad. Okay? It's a sin nature. Yes, you should feel bad, but we're all selfish. We should feel bad. I shouldn't say that. But you should feel bad, but we're selfish people. But Jesus was selfish or selfless? Selfless. We're becoming like Jesus, right? So when we delight ourselves in the Lord, we start to move from being selfish people, not asking for what we want. We start to become like Jesus, and we start to align our hearts with the Father, and we start to have the desires of the Father, because the desires of the Father are the best desires we should have because it leads us to health, it leads us to fulfillment, it leads us to His peace, His joy, His blessings, and everything. And so we start to shift. And so when we are in the presence, when we enter the Holy of Holies, when we are in prayer, when we are working and reading His Word, we start to delight in the Lord. When we delight in the Lord, what does He say? And He will give you the desires of your heart. Because your desires become His desires. Talking about that, I missed this. If you guys have that reading plan, I'm going to throw it up here right now, real quick, interject. You guys can start this reading plan, which will delight yourself in the Lord. <laughs> uh, but it is a great plan to read through uh, the Holy Week as we start Holy Week. It starts today. I encourage you, you can go to our app. You can find it on our app as well. But a great way to spend time in God's Word this week. And delighting yourself in the Lord, discovering who He is, doing relationship with Him. Because when we do that, our heart posture shifts. We don't desire the things of this world anymore. We start desiring what He has for us, which there's nothing wrong in the things of this world. But when we desire the things of this world, they become our God. But when we delight in the Lord, He becomes God and Lord, and then the things He created us for us to enjoy come underneath His desire for us. He still gives us what He knows is best for us, and we ask because He says, I need this for you. So we ask and He says, we ask in Jesus' name, and what happens? And He will give you your heart's desires. Answered prayer. Answered prayer. Powerful tool. And then it goes on. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same kind of work that I have done. That was the passage earlier, right? And he will do greater things. Anyone who believes in me, delights in the Lord, spends time with me, will start to do what I came to do. Because I came to what? Glorify the Father. What were you created to do? Glorify the Father. And so we start to realign our desires. We start to delight in the Lord. We start to pray. We start to spend time in His Word. God shifts things in the name of Jesus. We start to do the things that Christ did in the power of Christ. We start to do even greater things to reach the people that were not reached when Jesus was here because His reach was only in the area that He lived. And now the reach is starting to get wider. And God is doing powerful things through His people that delight themselves in the Lord. It's a, be it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then it ends by commit everything you do to the Lord. 
Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. He will help you. In the name of Jesus. The altar and prayer changes you. You start dancing to a different drum beat. You stop dancing to the drum beat of this world or to the drum beat that you have created. And you start dancing to a different drum beat. You start dancing to heaven's drum beat. You start dancing to the Father's drum beat. And then there is beauty that starts to emerge. We start living countercultural lives. We start living in ways that the culture looks at us and goes, Who are you? We don't fit in with culture anymore because we are aliens to this kingdom. We weren't created for this kingdom. We were created to transform this kingdom, but our kingdom is in heaven. We live an upside down life, a changed life. The name of Jesus changes us. This morning, I'd like to end this way. Today's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday was the, the week before when Jesus came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. And as he approached Jerusalem, there was this energy and excitement and, and people had palm branches. By the way, your kids' ministries are going to, kids are going to be walking out with palm branches today. They're going to be learning about Palm Sunday. If you don't, ask them. They'll tell you what Palm Sunday is because I'm hoping you're going to get a glimpse, just a little glimpse this morning, but they'll tell you what Palm Sunday is. But the whole of Jerusalem is excited. They're singing Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna meaning save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's this celebration and excitement because Jesus, the king, was coming in on, their do on this donkey and this was the king who was going to set them free from captivity. But here's what we see happening. Jesus keeps riding in the donkey and he keeps going past and he looks over Jerusalem. Here's excitement and Jesus makes this statement. He looks over Jerusalem and he wept. He wept. And, and the Greek says that a weeping is like this deep uh, heartbreak for the loss that he saw in Jerusalem. You know why? Because even though the people saw a king, they saw an earthly king. They were looking for someone that was going to come and set them free from the Roman uh, Empire, the government that was holding them down. They had the wrong Jesus in their head. And they didn't realize that this was a different Jesus who was coming to save them from their brokenness of sin. The same people that said Hosanna and celebrated the king a week later said crucify. They didn't know their Jesus. And Jesus wept because he realized that even though he had walked with these people, even though he had done the miracles, even though Jesus had fulfilled 300 prophecies that were said about him in the Old Testament. I mean, these people knew the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures. There were 300 prophecies pointing to Jesus. And he had fulfilled all 300 of those, by, close to those, by that time. And they still didn't know him. And they were just focused on the wrong Jesus. Because they hadn't come to the altar. They hadn't spent time. They hadn't truly understood this Jesus. They didn't realize the power that he had to overcome. Not just the worldly systems, but the spiritual bondage that we all live in. This morning, he's crying out to you. Say, do you know me? Do you have a relationship with me? Do you know the power that I have for you? Do you know that I'm for you and not against you? Do you know that I have blessings for you? Will you come and ask in my name? Would you stand to your feet? I want to do what I did last week. When we come to the altar, we are welcomed as friends of God as friends of God, not as enemies. 
this morning, I want to invite you to come to the altar. I have no secret agenda. I just want to help us live this life. I want to give you opportunities. I want you to come and meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want you to find a place where you can find freedom. There is not, just because you come to the altar doesn't mean that you have some grave sin that you, and maybe you do have sin. We all have sin. There's nobody here that doesn't have sin. Is there anyone that is sinless here? Anyone? No. Okay, we're all on the same page. But I want to invite you, no pressure, no arm twist. Would you come even as the worship team leads, just to spend time in his presence, to be with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to submit to him, to surrender to him. So even before they start, I want to invite you. Would you take a step forward to the safe place to find a spot where you can meet with the King of Kings? And we're going to spend some time worshiping. Go ahead and make your way. And you can come up front. Don't be afraid. You can kneel. You can sit. You can stand. Whatever you want to do. What are you doing when you come to the altar? You're coming to meet with the King of Kings. You're coming to meet with the Lord of Lords. You're coming to call out on the name of Jesus, the name that has power, the name that realigns our heart to the right source, not to all of the worldly systems and the world and the brokenness, but to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Maybe you need to come to the altar as husbands and wives. Maybe you need to bring your kids and pray over them. Maybe you need, this might be the first time, last week there was some freedom that happened at the altar and Jesus is waiting to meet with you. Would you lead us out? If you're not coming, please, let's worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything that you can do. I just want you. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where I started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Just take me back to where it started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm caught up in your prayer.
just want you, nothing else. Man, if you're not at the altar, can we just nothing sing this out to the King if you truly mean it? Nothing, nothing else will do. Will Everything do. I want is you, Lord. I just, I just want, want you. Can we raise our hands if we feel comfortable in this house? All we're doing is saying, I'm surrendering to you. Nothing else Nothing will do. Else. I need you and you alone, Lord Jesus. Nothing yes, Lord Jesus. Do. Hallelujah. Let's worship him. I just want you. Yes, Lord. We just want you Nothing in this place. Else. We want your presence to sweep through this place, Nothing through our hearts, else. through our lives. We surrender to you. We submit to you because you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's nothing else that will do in this place. Do you mean that? Are you hungry? Do you desire Him? Do you delight in the Lord this morning? Will you surrender everything that you have to Him? Your health, your finances, your marriage, your kids, your relationships, your work. Yes, Lord. it look like right now right now that each and every one of us prayed that prayer Lord Jesus nothing else will do nothing else will do all I want is you will you be Lord and Savior of my life Lord Jesus no matter if you've given your life to Jesus Christ or you haven't because there is more for every one of us would you take this moment just to pray that it's you and God God, nothing else will do. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender everything to you. I submit to you. I call on your name. I humble myself. I love you and I worship you. The place that you are standing right now, as you pray that has become your altar. Because you're communing with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're stepping in to the Holy of Holies. And you are calling on the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you are doing in this place right now. We thank you for the lives that you are setting free. We thank you for the restoration work that you are doing. We thank you for the hope that you have shown us through your word. We thank you for the confidence that we have in you. We thank you for the confident hope that we find in you. Thank you for the healing power and the presence that is here, that is moving through this place right now. I pray that you would touch every person in a way that only you can touch them, Lord, because you know their situation. You know the season that they're walking through. You know what is happening in their heart and in their mind. You know what they're thinking of right now. You know their fears. You know their uncertainties. You know their desires. You know everything about them, Lord. You know everything about me, Lord, because you are our creator. You are our God. And you are our king. And so we submit to you this morning and we say, have your way, Lord Jesus. And to speak life, speak truth, speak healing, speak restoration, speak hope into the hearts and lives of your people. So now, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless them and keep them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you his blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Have a blessed Sunday. We'll see you next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Invite someone, let them connect to Jesus. God bless you.